All right, let's continue on with constitutional isomers. And you probably remember the definition of isomers. It's something that you saw in general chemistry. Isomers are simply compounds that have different structures, but the same molecular formula. For example, if you had the formula C2H6O, there's two possible ways to connect those atoms together. You can either make an alcohol, CH3CH2OH, and that is ethanol, or you could connect them in this way where you have CH3OCH3, and that is called dimethyl ether. So just by virtue of their functional groups, you can clearly see, <laughs> excuse me, that these are two different compounds, different structures, with the same molecular formula. Well, constitutional isomers, uh, this is a definition that we use for compounds that have different connectivities of atoms. So again, same molecular formula, but the atoms are connected in a different way. Both of these compounds are C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so C6, H14. Right, they're both fully saturated. We know that because there's no pi bonds and no rings. Therefore, they're going to follow the generic formula CN H2N plus 2. 2 times 6 is 12, plus 2 gives you 14. However, the way that these molecules are connected together is different. Here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbons in a row. So this would be hexane. However, in the next compound, we have 1, 2, 3, or five in our parent, so this would be two methyl pentane. And so clearly, just by looking at their names, you can see that these are different compounds. They have the same molecular formula, but the atoms are connected to each other in a different order. So we call them constitutional isomers. You might be wondering, well, if I know the formula, Mr. Dion, is there any way to predict how many different constitutional isomers I have? The answer is no. <laughs> there is no quick rule that I can give you. However, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at any number of alkanes, as we go, you know, these all have the same formula, CnH2n plus 2. As you go from three carbons up to, let's say, you know, nine carbons in this range, you could probably take the time and draw all those constitutional isomers. However, once you get up to something like C10, You've got 75 different isomers, and then you get up to 20, and then you go up to getting, you know, up to almost half a million different isomers, and then you get into billions. It gets out of control very quickly once you get up to 40 carbons. And again, there's no way to predict how many isomers there are. There's no formula that I can give you for that. But you can see that it gets, we get into huge numbers of, um, of isomers very rapidly, and you can't even imagine how many isomers there must be if you have C100, H202. I bet you that's got, you know, trillions of different isomers. Anyhow, what you've got to be able to do as an organic chemistry student is recognize different structures as either being isomers of each other or being the same compound. So here we have hexane. Put that down on the last slide. Here we have two methyl 2-methyl pentane. And then this next molecule, you can see that we have the longest chain, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But now the methyl is in the third place. So this is 3-methyl methyl pentane. And then this compound here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4 carbons in the longest chain. So this is 2,2-dimethyl, 2,2-dimethyl butane. Then you go to the next one, we're still not done. This one has one, two, three, four, but it's two, three dimethyl butane. So here we've got two, three dimethyl, dimethyl butane. And if you had just been drawing bond line structures, it might be a knee jerk reaction to draw something like this and say, here you go, here you go, brand new bond line structure. However, this is not a brand new bond line structure. If you take this sigma bond, and remember, you can always rotate sigma bonds. If you rotate this bond um, 180 degrees, then you'd end up with something that looks like this, that looks like this, and you can see that this and this are identical. 
So you've got to be able to manipulate the molecule in your mind, number one. But number two, if you are finding it difficult to do that, you could also try and name the molecule. So if you name this molecule, you see the longest chain is one, two, three, four, five carbons. And we have a methyl group at carbon three. So this is three methyl, methyl pentane. So it's not a new compound. It's the same compound that we saw before. And so you can test to determine whether structures are isomers or not in one of two ways. You can flip one of the molecules in space, rotate the single bonds until it becomes superimposable on another molecule. Or if that doesn't work, you can always name them. If you end up with the same name, they're the same compound. If you take a look at different isomers, so these compounds are all isomers of one another. They're all, in fact, isomers of octane. And you probably recognize the word octane from when you go and purchase gasoline. Sometimes it'll have an octane rating. So this is octane here. All of these compounds are C8H. Sorry, I think I have a mistake in my slide here. Wendy. These are all CHH18. Anyhow, the bottom line is, is that you can see that when you burn octane, just plain old straight chain octane, you combine it with oxygen, it releases 500, or sorry, 5,470 kilojoules for every mole of octane that you burn. Check this out. If you make an isomer of octane, so this isomer is 2,5-dimethylhexane, 2,5-dimethylhexane. It has the exact same molecular formula, but when you burn it in the presence of oxygen, you can see that it releases less energy. And when you change the isomer to 2,2,3,3-tetramethylbutane, uh, so this is 2,2,3,3-tetra methyl butane that it releases even less energy what's the conclusion the conclusion is that the more branches you have here we only have two here we have four the more branches you have coming off of your parent chain the less energy is released when combustion occurs and that means that as you have more branching the molecule must be more stable has greater stability because it releases less energy when it undergoes combustion. Now, the obvious question would be, why? Why does that happen? Well, it's based off of something called proto-branching, and that is definitely beyond the scope of our course. However, it's something that my students need to know. Basically, the take-home message for you as an Organic Chemistry 1 student is that branched alkanes are lower in energy and more stable than straight-chain alkanes. You might be wondering, where do all these alkanes come from? I've heard of propane because you use that maybe to run your barbecue. You've heard of octane because I'm sure that everybody's seen that word at a gas station before. You might have heard of butane uh, because butane is what's found in a Bic lighter, for example. You know, you might be wondering, where do these compounds come from? You might have even heard of benzene. Where does that come from? And the answer is that all of these alkanes that we're talking about, they come from crude oil. And I'm sure that if you've watched the news, you've heard about crude oil. And, you know, sometimes, you know, people will think, well, crude oil, that's, you know, that's just where gasoline comes from. The only thing that you come, the only thing that comes from um, petroleum is crude oil. However, that the only thing that comes from crude oil is gasoline. However, that's not true. When the crude oil is refined, the only, it only produces about 19% gasoline. However, this can undergo refining, so refining and cracking. And after it undergoes refining, you can get about 47% gasoline from crude oil. So I should say refining and cracking can give you about 47%. However, there's all kinds of other fractions or components that come from crude oil that are separated by distillation not just gasoline. We also get solvents like hexane and butane and heptane and pentane. We also get natural gas. Natural gas is largely comprised of methane and ethane. 
Um, we also get things like kerosene, diesel, lubricating oil, waxes, asphalt, tires. All of these different alkanes come from crude oil and they're isolated by distillation. So some students told me that my, my microphone cut out. All I said was in this slide, the main take home message is that branched alkanes are lower in energy, therefore they are more stable than straight chain hydrocarbons. And I said that you do not need to know why. I said it's based on something called proto branching. So I can write it down here, proto branching. And that is beyond the scope of our course, proto branching. I'll leave it there for you, that term. If you want to research it on your own time, go ahead. However, I will not ask you anything about that. You just need to know the concept that's highlighted in yellow. All right, we're going to skip the rest of this section and because I'm not going to ask you anything about it. <laughs> and we're going to get into some new ways of viewing molecules on paper and thinking about them in our minds and new ways of maybe holding a model set if you had one. And we're going to talk about Newman projections. And Newman projections were invented by Melvin Newman. So um, he was from Ohio State University, so an American chemist. And it says here that rotation about carbon-carbon single bonds allows a compound to adopt a variety of possible 3D shapes called conformers. And there's a bunch of different ways that we can represent the three-dimensional shape of a compound. We can use wedges and dashes. I've gone over these with you. When you have a wedge, it means it's coming out towards you. When you have a dash, it means it's going into the page. You can also turn a compound on its side to make what's called a sawhorse projection. And then you can turn it completely 180 degrees from here and you get a Newman projection. So if you took your eyeball and you looked at this molecule, so this is an eyeball that I'm drawing here, there's the eyelashes. If you viewed this molecule on this end, what you would see is the Newman projection. And what's so great about Newman projections is that they're great for comparing the relative stability let me grab my model kit and I'll show you a little bit more about the wedge and dash, the sawhorse, and the Newman projection. So I'm just going to flip over to my camera here. Here we go. Okay, so here I have a molecular model of ethane, CH3, CH3. You can see that we have three carbons or sorry, three hydrogens on a carbon, and then we have another three hydrogens. And there's free rotation around the carbon-carbon bond. There's no reason why you can't rotate a single or a sigma bond. Now, if you look at the compound from the wedge and stick point of view, you can see how some of the atoms here are coming towards you, and some of them are going away from you. Right? We can see that as some of them are coming towards you, and some of them are going back into the screen. But if I turn that slightly, like this maybe, like that, then you get a sawhorse projection. So if I turn it like this, you get the sawhorse. Or you can see this CH3 over here, like this, and then you can see the other CH3 over here. That's a sawhorse. But again, if you take your eyeball and you look at the molecule straight on, then you see a Newman projection. So this is looking at the molecule perfectly straight. Can you guys see my camera? Okay, cool. So good, just double checking. Okay, so give me a thumbs up if you can see the Newman projection going from the model that I'm holding up and the picture that you see on the paper or in the textbook maybe. Okay, you'd have to have the slides printed or something, but there you go, so that's a Newman projection. So you're taking something that's in 3D, then you're turning it like this, and you're getting the Newman projection. The way that I have it now, you see that this hydrogen atom is exactly between the two in the back. We call this a staggered conformation. But we know that there's free rotation around that carbon-carbon bond, and what I can do is I can rotate that bond so that all the hydrogen atoms are blocking each other now. We call this conformation an eclipsed conformation. And as you can imagine, this is higher energy than when I have them staggered. 
like this. Why would it be higher in energy when they're all blocking each other? Well, remember that in every bond, I have two electrons, two electrons here, two electrons here, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I take it out of the staggered conformation and I put it in an eclipsed conformation like this, now the electrons, which are all negatively charged in those bonds, are closer to each other. You see, and now they're eclipsing or blocking each other and you have repulsion between the electrons and those bonds and it's like higher in energy. And so if the bond rotates so that it's staggered, then it's going to be lower in energy. So lower in energy. And then if I rotate the bond so that it's eclipsed, it's going to be higher in energy because it's like, I don't like being like this. I want to be staggered, not eclipsed. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that idea. And I'm going to go back to my slides. Anybody with me? Good. Thanks, Angel. Good. Okay. Doing my best to try to explain it remotely. So, yeah, let's go back to the slides here. So, a Newman projection. Newman projection. And again, you can see why having a model kit can be very handy when you're studying Newman projections. Well, What's cool about Newman projections is that you can draw them just from um, a regular old wedge and dash drawing of a molecule. It says here, a Newman projection is a perspective at looking straight down a particular carbon-carbon bond. We've already seen that. And how do you represent the carbons that are in the bonds? This is kind of interesting. I remember learning this for the first time back in like 1995 or something. The first carbon, so these are the two carbons you're looking at. OK, or the two that I have in this oval, the first one that you're seeing. We'll highlight uh, we can see what you're talking about, sir. Try again. Share screen. OK, that should be better. OK, so it says here a Newman projection is the perspective of looking straight down a particular carbon carbon bond good enough. Now, if we're looking at this molecule here and we want to draw the Newman projection that we see here, how do you go from here to here? How do you do that? Well, here's what you do. The carbon that I have highlighted in blue is one of the two carbons that we're going to be looking down its axis. So we're looking down the axis from the blue carbon to the red carbon. OK, so how do you represent those carbons in the Newman projection? The blue carbon is represented as just a dot. So it's this dot here, okay? This is the blue carbon. And the blue carbon has three bonds going off besides the bond between the blue and the red carbon, right? It's got a bond going down to this methyl group, which is this right here, but then it also has two hydrogens. It's got a hydrogen going in back and it's got a hydrogen coming out in front. That's these two hydrogens here. The carbon in red, the second carbon, we represent that as this circle right here, this big circle. Okay, so this is the carbon in back. And the carbon in back has three things coming off of it. It's got a methyl group, that's the dash. It's got the chlorine that's in the plane of the screen. And then it also has a hydrogen coming out in front like this. Remember that this is a CH3 group here. So now when you're looking down this bond, you rotate it in such a way that you're looking at everything that's in the plane of the screen. So we have this methyl group, the blue carbon, the red carbon, and the chlorine. None of those are on dashes and wedges. Everything there should be pointing straight up or straight down. Since the viewer's head is like here, like this is the person's nose right here, right? This is their, really, this is their mouth. Yay, chemistry, okay, their hair. So that means the methyl group is going down. So this is going down, the methyl group is pointing down. The chlorine is going up. So here's the chlorine going up like that. I've got the blue carbon in front. I've got the red carbon in back. Now on the blue carbon, I've got two hydrogens. Well, remember that the, carbon, the carbon's um, molecular geometry is tetrahedral. And so these two hydrogens are going to be as far away from the methyl group as possible. And then for these two, this is the trickiest part. Which one is going to the left and which one is going to the right? 
Well, again, if you're viewing it going down that carbon-carbon bond that I have highlighted in green, the methyl group is going into the page. And so when you swing this part of the molecule backwards this way, the methyl group, since it's going into the page, it's going to be on the left-hand side, whereas the hydrogen is going to be pointing to, to the, to the right-hand side because it's pointing out. So we have the hydrogen, which is going to be over here. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. So somebody says, do they always have to be rotated like that? Like to not shadow the one at the back. I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but Koi, the bottom line is I could ask you to draw me a Newman projection down any carbon-carbon bond. So we show an eyeball and we say you're viewing it down this act or down this carbon carbon bond, and then you have to draw what you're seeing. All right, so it could be any. Where did the other methyl come from? So what other methyl? All right, if we erase everything on here, okay, erase all of this, right? This when you have just have a wedge or a dash coming out here. What's at the end of this? This is a bond line structure, so this is a methyl group, right? Since it's a bond line structure, we don't have to draw that in. So that's where this is coming from. This is also a methyl group. This is a CH3 and this is a CH3. Does that help, Andrew? So if I highlight this methyl in yellow, it's this one. And if I highlight this methyl in green, it's the one that's going to the left. All right, there we go. So drawing Newman projections, challenging, but definitely doable, right? But you've got to practice manipulating objects in your mind's eye. So let's try a practice problem. It says here in the case below, draw a Newman projection is viewed from the angle indicated. So here we have the observer. I'm going to help you out a little bit on this one. I don't like the way it's drawn particularly. I'm going to draw this chlorine on a wedge, <laughs> excuse me, put this chlorine on a dash like this. And so what's in the plane? In the plane, we have this methyl, CH2, this carbon, and this carbon. All right. So that's everything that's in the plane. We also have a hydrogen going in the back here, and we have a hydrogen coming out front like this. All right. So this is a methyl group. And this is a methyl group over here. Okay, the first carbon is the blue carbon that I have, or the carbon that I have highlighted in blue. So that's going to be a dot. And there's going to be three bonds coming off of that. One to the methyl, but that's going straight up. So we have the bond to the methyl going straight up. Then you have two other bonds coming off of it to the two hydrogens. Now, since the two atoms are identical, we don't really have to worry about left and right. You have two hydrogens. Now, for the back carbon, which is the carbon that I have in red, we're going to draw a circle like this. And then there's going to be three bonds coming off of that circle. And since this molecule is staggered, we're going to have them coming off like this. So we don't draw lines through the circle. That's incorrect. They have to be coming off the edge of the circle. So what's going to be coming straight down? Can anybody tell me, would it be a chlorine here or a methyl in this black circle that I have here? Yes, it's going to be the methyl, right? The methyl is going straight down. So we're going to put the CH3 group in here. And then I've got the two chlorines like this. OK, everything is good so far. Everything's great. But now what I want to do is ask you something else. If I label this chlorine, we'll call this chlorine A, and we'll call this chlorine B. If I highlight this chlorine in yellow, would that be chlorine A or chlorine B? The one that I have highlighted in the Newman projection, would that be chlorine A or chlorine B? Exactly, it's chlorine A. Right, again, think of yourself as the observer, and Mr. Dion is not a very good artist, but if we draw the person here, so here's the person, 
<coughs> here's the person's body. The person's left hand is over here. So this is the left hand. And then the person's right hand is coming out on this side. So this chlorine, I'll circle it in red. This chlorine is next to the person's right hand. So when you take this whole thing and you rotate it in this direction, this chlorine in yellow is going to be chlorine A, and this will be chlorine B. The same thing for the hydrogens. If I label this as hydrogen A and hydrogen B, you can see that hydrogen A is on the left hand side. So this is hydrogen A, and hydrogen B is on the person's right hand side. So this must be hydrogen B over here. Again, it's something that you've got to be able to do is manipulate something in two dimensions on paper, but think about it in three dimensions in your mind. It's not that simple, is it? Well, I want to end off today's lecture by talking about one more thing, which is confirmational analysis. And we're going to talk about it a little bit tomorrow as well. But the reason I want to get in it, into it today is because we discussed a little bit of it already. When I showed you the Newman projection, <coughs> of ethane, and that's what this is here. This is just plain old ethane. So if we had CH3, CH3, so we've got a hydrogen here, hydrogen here, hydrogen here, and a hydrogen here. So this is just plain old ethane. And I showed you the difference between a staggered and an eclipse structure. Well, when you have the staggered structure, the angle between atoms on adjacent carbons, we call that the dihedral angle or the torsional angle. Either one is perfectly reasonable. And when you have ethane being completely staggered, the, dihe the dihedral angle is 60 degrees. And that makes sense because the circle is 360. And if you divide it by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 360 divided by 6 gives you 60 degrees. Okay, perfectly reasonable. But that's a definition that you need. To know. So going back to the staggered and eclipse conformations of ethane, we see that the staggered conformation is lower in energy, like I told you, because there's less electron electron repulsions. But what's the cost? How much higher in energy is the eclipsed conformation? It happens to be higher in energy by 12 kilojoules per mole. So if it's 12 kilojoules per mole and you have three interactions between these groups of hydrogens, 12 divided by three gives you four. So that means that each one of those hydrogens that's blocking another hydrogen costs you four kilojoules per mole. I have that shown right here, the different conformations of ethane. Again, you see that when it's staggered, it's lower in energy than when it's eclipsed. Eclipsed like this. It also says that notice that all the staggered conformations are degenerate. That means they all have the equal energy. So degenerate means equal energy. It doesn't mean that they've committed a crime or something. Anyhow, and all of the eclipse conformations are degenerate as well. And again, you see the cost and energy to go up to the eclipsed conformation is 12 kilojoules per mole. If you're wondering what the hell is going on in this picture, pardon my language, let me just switch over. To my camera here. A second. And here's our ethane molecule. Right here. So here's our ethane molecule. If I have it perfectly staggered like this, again, it's lower energy than when it rotates and it becomes eclipsed, then it's higher in energy. If you keep rotating it, we rotate it again, 60 degrees like this, then it's going to be lower in energy. Then you rotate it another 60 degrees and it's going to be higher in energy. Then you rotate it another 60 degrees and it's going to drop. It's going to, oops, dropped one little too far. It's going to be lower in energy. Then you eclipse it and it's going to be higher in energy. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the rationale. All I'm doing is rotating the bond. If it's eclipsed, it's high energy. And if it's staggered, it's low energy. Woo, woo, woo. Anyhow, cool. Yeah, pretty neat, huh? So, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, will it, so, will it prefer staggered or eclipsed? 
it's going to prefer staggered, right? A molecule always wants to be in its lowest energy conformation. It wants to be in its most relaxed state. It doesn't want to be in a high energy conformation. It wants to come down and have less potential energy, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank All you. Right. Yeah, no problem. So let's go back here. Share screen. See if it works this time. So what did we cover? Torsional angle or dihedral angle, angle staggered, eclipsed, conformations, uh, Newman projections, de degenerate, all kinds of cool stuff. But check this out. If you have propane, it's interesting too because when you have propane, which is just CH3, CH2, CH3, it's going to be similar to ethane, similar but different, right? Because you see that there's a higher jump in energy to get to the eclipsed conformation. Why would that be? Because when you eclipse propane, you're going to have not just a hydrogen next to a hydrogen every time. You have two hydrogens next to hydrogens, but one of the interactions is between a hydrogen and a methyl, and a methyl is much bigger than a hydrogen. So it causes more steric hindrance, and that's why it costs more energy to go up there. So let me show you one more thing. It says the barrier for rotation for propane is 14 kilojoules per mole, which is two more than ethane, right? Ethane was only 14. Well, we already calculated that each one of these interactions, we call these gauche interactions, each one of these interactions for the two hydrogens, it was four kilojoules per mole. So four plus four gives you eight. And if the total is 14, 14 minus eight gives you six. So that means that this costs you six kilojoules per mole. I don't ask you to memorize those numbers. I'm just kind of showing you where they come from. So the eclipsing interaction for a hydrogen and a methyl is six kilojoules per mole, but for two hydrogens, it's uh, only uh, um, four kilojoules per mole. Anyhow, let me go back to my camera and I'll show you propane. Let's see here, let's go back. It's really fun going back from camera to here. There we go. So here's a model of propane. So here's propane. And I have it like this, okay? So now, this is just, you can see it's CH3. CH2 and then a CH3 at the end. So now if we look down any one of the carbon-carbon bonds, but if we look down this bond like this, now I've got it staggered, okay? I'm looking down this carbon-carbon bond, okay? This carbon-carbon bond. We're taking our eyeball and we're looking down there. So you see how everything is staggered. This hydrogen is in between these two hydrogens, etc. But now we have the methyl group, the CH3, that's in between these two hydrogens. So this is going to be the lowest energy conformation. If I rotate it 60 degrees, now it's going to be higher energy because I have these two hydrogen atoms eclipsing each other, these two, but now on this side, I've got this hydrogen atom in the back being eclipsed by this whole giant methyl out front. So that costs even more energy. Then I rotate it another 60 degrees. It drops in energy because it's staggered. Then I rotate it another 60 degrees and it goes up in energy because it's eclipsed. I rotate it 60 degrees, it drops in energy because it's staggered. I rotate it 60 degrees, it increases because it's eclipsed. Again, you can see the eclipsing interaction here between, if I turn it to the side, you see the hydrogen is eclipsed by the entire methyl group. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. Anybody with me? Cool. I'll give you the double thumbs for that because it's not easy. Definitely not easy. It's challenging. And then again, if you go to the Science Center at UCCS, they have some really good model kits there, or at least a model kit that you could look at and give it the old color. So there you go, confirmational analysis of propane. So what I'd like you to do before class on Thursday is, of course, to work on the homework for Chapter 3 and I'm going to publish information about quiz three once I finish writing that. But I want you to always try to finish reading the entire chapter before lecture. So when we start lecture on Thursday, we're going to take a look at the conformational analysis of butane. And what's cool about butane is that you see there's different types of 
eclipse confirmations, and there's different types of staggered confirmations, so it's a little bit more complex. And then we're going to get into the cycloalkanes, and we're going to spend a whole bunch of time talking about <laughs> cyclohexane. I don't know if anybody is into, um, uh, oh, is it closed for the summer? Okay, I guess it is. I wasn't aware of that. Anyhow, um, something that you might see sometimes are some uh, memes about organic chemistry. And I remember I, one of my students showed me one. What are the things I learned in organic chemistry? And the person said, all I learned was how to draw hexagons. And the reason why is because a hexagon represents cyclohexane. And cyclohexane is the most important of all of the cycloalkanes. And so on Thursday, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about cyclohexane. And we're going to learn how to draw cyclohexane. And then we're going to talk about substitutions on cyclohexane, di-substituted cyclohexanes, cis-trans isomerism in cyclohexane. And I think that'll wrap and then polycyclic systems. We don't cover that section. So a lot of talk about cyclohexane is coming your way. And thus, I highly recommend that you finish reading the chapter before coming to class on Thursday. All right, I think it was a pretty fun class today. I actually like had a good time doing some practice problems. Let's see here, stop recording. <laughs>